I'm not sure that this is my story to tell. It was a story I heard from my father, and it was a story he heard from his father before that. It's affected us all, I guess. That's why I feel some ownership over the tale I'm about to share. It's followed our family for three generations. My grandfather was a hunter. He had a reputation. The best furs in Wyoming all had my family name attached to them. That reputation earned my grandfather some pretty historic invites. He met the vice president once. The invite at the center of my story, however, brought him to Yellowstone National Park. Nowadays, when you hear the name Yellowstone, it's attached to an idea of beauty. A scenic lake, hot geysers, and a slumbering volcano. That wasn't the case in the late 1950s. Mismanagement of the park and its fauna led to overpopulation and overgrazing. The vegetation was being stripped bare. Elk were especially problematic. The park service invited a few hunters to come into Yellowstone and deal with the elk. Hunting was permitted in Yellowstone at the time, so the act wasn't particularly surprising. It was the amount of death that shook the park service and jeopardized its relationship with the public. In the end, over 5,000 elk were killed. It was called an extermination, and my grandfather was part of it. His story wasn't about the elk, though. His story was about the thing that came out of Yellowstone, chasing all of that death. My grandfather had positioned himself in a clearing. He climbed a deer tower and enjoyed a 360-degree view of the area. It was only a matter of time before an elk came along. He missed his mark and hit the elk in the backside. The gunshot scared any other wildlife out of the area, and the injury wasn't enough to put the animal down. My grandfather decided to give chase. He followed the trail of blood through Yellowstone. Strangely enough, it seemed the elk had led him back to a larger herd. Branches were trampled and the foliage was eaten bare. My grandfather slowed down. He was more interested in surveying the massive herd than he was in pursuing the single elk he'd hit. He was careful and quiet in the way that only hunters can be. When all the tracks he was following began to converge, he was certain that a herd of elk was waiting for him just through the next tree line. He pushed forward. When his vision penetrated the wall of chewed greenery, he came upon something else. There were no elk. There were signs that they had slept there. There were more grazing patterns and tracks around the perimeter. But there were no elk. It appeared that the herd had gathered there, walked tirelessly in a circle, and then vanished. He returned the rifle to his back and began to investigate. When the sound of a snapping tree branch came from nearby, he looked. He saw what looked like an elk's rack shifting among the trees. Then came its face, the head of a large bull with deep, dark eyes set in the back of its skull. My grandfather described this part better than me. He said the animal, while its body was still obscured by the forest, looked into him. He said those dark eyes glimpsed his soul. He described the light changing overhead as time seemed to blur, and he became snared by the gaze of the animal. Eventually, the elk came forward. What stepped out of the tree line was no living animal. Below the neck, the elk's body was gaunt, its fur was matted and patchy. When it entered the den, it stood upright. It stood at least 12 feet tall, as my grandfather described it. When it shifted and lurched, he could see its tight skin dragging against its bones underneath. He said he felt it judge him. He heard a voice in his head, something that challenged the very purpose that had brought him there. He said looking at the beast that he knew immediately that he needed to stop killing. He couldn't continue as a hunter. My grandfather told my dad that he knew immediately hunting would lead him down the same emaciated path that had starved this creature. He said he knew he would become something like the monster he was staring at. Then, according to my grandfather, the beast wandered back into the woods. There were no elk left there for it to consume. It moved on to find a meal elsewhere. 
My grandfather only killed a dozen elk that season. Out of the 5,000 total, 12 isn't very many. The monster he saw forgave him for that dozen. My family hasn't picked up a gun since. My father swore that he'd never touch a firearm, and I had no reason to. The hunting itch was out of our blood by then. We all know of the monster, though. We've all had that creature described to us with such detail that we never once considered going back on my grandfather's words. We all understand that lifting another rifle, taking another life, will invite whatever curse had deformed that thing. Then it will be us wandering the woods, searching for our own kind. We've never heard of any other sightings. None of the other hunters who came out of Yellowstone were changed in the same way as my grandfather. The massacre would lead to widespread change in the Park Service, though. Maybe there was enough death to scare the hunters even without the glimpse of that creature to motivate them. I hear that Yellowstone is beautiful now. Like I said earlier, it's all geysers and lake beds. I think I'd like to see it. I'd like to see the place where life was able to grow back. But the last thing I want to see is that creature. What if it decides it isn't looking for elk anymore? What if it decides that letting my family go was a mistake? I was looking to get a job closer to home. The 45 minute drive was starting to get old and I always felt too tired to drive. The last straw was the day I fell asleep at the wheel. Fortunately, I woke up right before colliding with a red car. That was when I committed to acquiring a job closer to home. As luck would have it, it didn't take long before I applied for a job 10 minutes from home. A dream come true. The interview went okay, but I was the better candidate. During the tour, the boss pointed out my office space. This was the point where I was told that my office was haunted. I was dumbfounded. Surely my boss was pulling my leg, a gag to get the new guy. Before long, it seemed like everyone was telling me about my haunted space. The janitor told me about what happened. 25 years ago, a guy worked in the office over a weekend. He had a heart attack and they found him the following Monday. The guy was single with no family to speak of, so his spirit remained. I felt for sure the janitor was in on the joke. Then I started to hear stories from co-workers that stayed late to work. They saw a man standing at the end of the hallway. When they looked again, he disappeared. Others saw him as they drove past when they knew there wasn't anyone else in the building. Others heard something as they walked through the halls. Just so you know, I do believe in ghosts, but I am skeptical at times. Then came the day I had my own experience with the office ghost. I was working late one night, which wasn't unusual at all. I was at the computer working on a project due within the next few days, so I was feeling the time crunch. After a couple of hours, I felt someone was watching me. Then I heard heavy breathing behind me. I knew I was the only person in the office building, so it had to be the ghost. Without even looking, I yelled, I don't have time for this! Just like that, the heavy breathing stopped, and I felt alone again. At least the ghost was friendly enough to let me work. I didn't have any more issues the rest of that night. The following experience happened about six months later. I was working late with a colleague as we raced to get another project done so that we could enjoy our weekend for once. It was around midnight when we finally finished. We said our goodbyes, and he left. I had a few things to tie up before I could head home. I did my regular routine. I checked my emails one last time, fed the office fish, turned off the lights. On my way out, I felt uneasy. I knew something was watching me, and it's the worst feeling. My blood ran cold when I stepped off the last step on the staircase leading from the second floor. Out of nowhere, I heard a raspy voice tell me goodnight. It scared the hell out of me. I quickened my pace and got out of Dodge. Now I know what you're thinking. How rude of me not to reply with a good night in return. Well, for your information, I did at least reply back. I certainly didn't want to make a ghost mad at me. 
They say children and pets can see ghosts. However, for whatever reason, adults often can't see them. I believe it's true. A couple of months back, I brought my son to work with me late at night. I had a few things to grab from my office for the weekend. Of course, I was the only one in the building again. As I was leaving with my son, who's two years old, I encouraged him to say goodbye to the ghost. I didn't think he'd wave goodbye. Sure enough, he did. It wasn't a half-hearted attempt either. He looked at a particular spot, waved, and tried to say goodbye. Talk about freaky. All in all, I'll have to say that this ghost is friendly. I've never heard of any attacks against my co-workers, who often speak fondly of the ghost. People will still come up to me to talk about the spirit. Recently, a co-worker had an encounter with a ghost. She was working late and she heard footsteps in the hallway. She looked outside her door and there wasn't anything there. She shrugged it off and went back to work. Again, she heard footsteps. Once again, she peeked into the hallway with the same results. A third time, she heard the footsteps, but before she could check the hallway, a figure floated right by her doorway. Understandably, she screamed and quickly exited the building without turning off her equipment. She refuses to work late anymore because of that night. She described the appearance of the figure to me. The outfit was outdated. Based on that description alone, I knew it was the ghost. I tried to explain that she didn't need to worry about the ghost, but she wouldn't have any of it. Just the other night, I had another experience with the ghost, and I made sure to practice what I preached to my coworker. Yet again, I was working late. I know, shocker, right? Over my music, I could hear talking in the hallway. I turned off my music, and the talking continued. My office is located halfway down the hall. The talking continued as I inched my way to the door. As soon as I opened the door, the talking stopped. Nobody was in the hallway. I told the ghost it was okay that he was there, but it also sounded like there was another voice as well. Perhaps there's more than one ghost in the office. I keep telling myself they won't bother me, and so far that's been true. Maybe they're more than just ghosts. Possibly, they're the office guardian angels. It's a nice thought that my coworker might actually believe. I suppose... Only time will tell. I grew up on a small farm in Nevada. My parents wanted to be able to live off the land when they had me, so they bought it shortly after I was born. I was raised caring for the animals that we had. They weren't raised to slaughter, rather, they were raised for their byproducts. They had great lives on the farm, truly. I was homeschooled, too. I didn't have any friends that weren't my relatives. My relatives would come and visit, and I'd see how different their lives were than mine. My cousins had video games, they watched TV and movies, and any toys that they wanted, they had. I envied them. They came to visit one weekend, and I spent a lot of time outside showing my cousin the goat pen. He was really interested in petting them, and we had a good time. I saw off in the distance a pack of dogs. Didn't think too much about it at the time. There were some strays around after all. They left later that night to go back home. I was in my room reading a book and I heard my cousin call my name from outside my window. I hesitated for a moment. I saw them get in the car and drive off. How was he outside my window? I heard it again and I stood up to look out the window. I didn't see anything. I certainly didn't see my cousin. I heard it again around the corner of the house. I slipped my shoes on and went to go find him. I didn't understand why he'd come back. I saw that the driveway only had my parents' car, so I knew he didn't come back with his family. I called his name when I went outside. No answer. I turned around the corner and I noticed one of the goats in the pen was loose. I was able to chase him back inside before he ran off somewhere. I kind of thought my cousin had come back somehow, or stowed away in the pen so he could spend more time with the goats. I just wished he'd been more careful. I called his name again as I made my way into the building. 
There was a black dog standing in the center of the pen. One of our goats laid below it, and there was blood everywhere. The dog just stared at me, unblinking and motionless. I have encountered a lot of strays, and most of them ran away as soon as they saw one of us. This one didn't flinch. I picked up a stick on the ground and threw it at the dog. It had already killed the goat. I wouldn't let it kill anymore. I moved and I saw its eyes trained on me, with a slight glow from inside them. I picked up a large rock and tossed it at the dog, hitting it right between the eyes. It slowly began to stand up. At first I thought it was just standing, like how dogs do for treats but then it moved forward on its hind legs. What was weird about it is that it walked without any issues, like it was used to walking on its hind legs. I backed up to the wall of the pen and screamed. The dog ran away from me on its hind legs. It was fast, too. Abnormally fast for a dog alone, but for a dog running on its hind legs, it was just wrong. I ran inside and told my dad what I saw. Then I helped him dig a hole for our goat that was killed. He made sure I didn't look at it, but later in life, I asked him what he thought it was, and he told me that the body was badly mutilated, like it wasn't a normal attack. We tried to keep a close eye on the goats after this, but even with the extra precautions we took, they started going missing. It broke my heart. I loved those goats, and something evil was tormenting them. I could hear them sometimes at night. They sounded so afraid. We'd go check in the morning and one or two would be gone, leaving nothing but small blood trails. My father told me I wasn't supposed to go in there alone anymore because it was too dangerous. So there was nothing I could do. One night, my father and I heard what sounded like my mother calling from outside. We happened to know she was in bed sleeping. She had a headache earlier in the day and wanted the rest. My father grabbed his shotgun and went out to handle the situation. I know he'd been fed up with whatever was tormenting us. I stood on the porch and watched my father walk right into the field where my mother's voice called us from. My heart skipped a beat when I saw one of those dogs running away from the pen. It had been sitting behind it, and when my father approached, it quickly left. Inside the pen, I heard two gunshots. Shortly after, my father walked out with his gun in his hands. I remember asking him what it was, and he told me with shaky breath just to go to bed. It was handled. I told him about the one I saw running away, and he said he'd find it and kill it before it hurt anything on his farm. I often wonder what exactly that thing was and what happened in the pen. I'd never seen my father so frazzled before. But after that night, we didn't see or hear those things again.